Thanks so much for inviting me to talk today. Just one moment when I click. There we go. Right. OK. So I'm going to talk today to you about Mary MacArthur, trade union leader and champion of women workers' rights. Was, by all accounts, a captivating speaker. Keep on, miss, yelled a young woman at one of her outdoor union talks. It's better than the seaside. I don't think that I can claim that my talk will transform anyone to the beach, no matter how much we all long for this at the moment, not just on any old gloomy mid-January day, but in the midst of a very difficult time for us all. But nevertheless, Mary MacArthur's story is a compelling one. It's packed of courage, of passion for life, and it shows her utter determination to make things better for women workers everywhere. Now, some of you will know um, that this talk had to be rearranged when I fell at the end of last year and broke my wrist. Grumbling about my injury, a friend reminded me of this campaigner, suffragist, local politician, wife and mother, Hannah Mitchell, whose early 20th century autobiography is one of my favourite books. You could see yourself, said my friend, as the temporary embodiment of women workers through the ages. And Hannah Mitchell's famous phrase when she talked about women's activism was that no cause can be won between dinner and tea. And most of us who are married had to work with one hand tied behind us. So here's to all who know what one hand tied behind them feels like. Be it a broken wrist, the double shift of work and family stuff, or other difficulties. Be they emotional, physical, or both. And here today, especially a big cheers to the women of the early 20th century labour movement who work so tirelessly to make things better for women in paid employment. So I was really delighted when I discovered that Mary MacArthur is included in the British Library's Unfinished Business exhibition. Specifically, it's her role as strike leader in Craigley Heath in the Black Country that brings her into the exhibition's story in the fight for women's rights. Mary MacArthur became very well known in that region after the 1910 Women Chainmakers Strike, which resulted in the workers receiving a minimum wage, not just for the yeah. chainmakers, but for their young leader, who they called Our Mary and who was still much loved in the area when eight years later, in 1918, she was adopted as the Labour Party's candidate in Stourbridge in the first general election at which some women were now permitted to vote. She didn't win the seat, though she did come a very respectable second, but she was ready to fight again and surely to embark on another phase of an already remarkable career it was not, however, to be. For Mary MacArthur died on the 1st of January, 1921, aged just 40. Her legacy is extraordinary, but she was not just a presence to be reckoned with in the black country. She was a leader whose work was of countrywide significance and whose work remains so relevant today. So who was she? Her name is still very familiar in Cradley Heath. Look, for example, at these wonderful sculptures, sculptures of chain makers in the Mary MacArthur Park. But her name is certainly not known to the same extent anywhere else in the country, although there have been a few recent additions to public, to public history that are helping. Um, for example, there's now a blue plaque on her final home in Golders Green. She's included on the plinth of Gillian Waring's statue of Millicent Fawcett in Parliament Square. And these are important starts. And pleased as I am that her work as a suffragist, campaigning specifically for votes for all working class men and women is publicly, publicly acknowledged on this statue. It is her trade union work 
that arguably still needs much greater recognition. After all, when she died, she was referred to as one of the greatest leaders the British Labour movement had ever had. So who, let's see, let's hear a little bit more about her early life. She was born in Glasgow in August 1880, the eldest of three daughters whose father ran a high-end drapery business. And whilst her childhood was very comfortable and her background middle class, there were a few indications that the MacArthur girls were not merely expected to follow the route laid out for so many girls in their position. In other words, school, followed by something to occupy them until Mr. Wright, or at least Mr. Acceptable, came along. I got the strong impression that the MacArthur girls were encouraged to speak their minds as opposed to merely being seen but not heard. Mary and her sister Jean were removed from a private girls academy to a school run by the Glasgow School Board. They received a much more academic and rounded education than that on offer at the more traditional academy. But at 16, Mary left school and went to Germany for around about a year. And frustratingly for me, the trail goes completely cold here. But it seems possible that whilst there, she stayed with associates of her father's uh, learning business methods, certainly doing that rather than attending any fancy finishing school. In fact, when she came home to Scotland, she worked as a bookkeeper in the family's new business in Eyre, the seaside town on the west coast where they now lived. If anyone was ho hoped that Mary would be content with this and with the social life in Eyre, which appears to be dances and people holding at homes, um, often re uh, revolving around the local Primrose League, which existed to support the upkeep and the defense of the British Empire and to uphold conservative principles and traditions, they were sorely disappointed. Mary was by all accounts bored. She took on some part-time work for the local RAG, and it was this that led directly to her very different focus. And she loved telling the story of what happened. She said, as a journalist, I attended a labor meeting in a country town in Scotland to get material for a skit. At this meeting, there were six members on the platform and five in the hall, all jumping up and down and arguing organization. I'd gone there to make fun of the radicals who held their meetings in a miserable hole above a fish shop. But while there on my frivolous errand, I became converted and joined the little band. The union organizer, John Turner of the Shop Assistants Union, said years later that he spotted Mary MacArthur as soon as he came into the room, a laughing, vivacious, fair-haired girl, clearly the leader of a group of young women who were gathered around her. An astute union organiser, he recognised the importance for the meeting of getting the attention of the dominant personality in the room. And he was right. From here, this young woman seeking a meaningful role in her life, immersed herself in union work within her branch, as a delegate at conferences, becoming president of the Union's Scottish Council, bear in mind she's still in her early 20s, and becoming the first woman elected onto the Union's national executive. There was much work to do. Shop work, in particular in the large department stores, was regarded by many parents as a respectable job for daughters, more refined than factory work, higher status than the drudgery of domestic service, but it was extremely arduous. Pay was low, rules draconian, hours excessive. There were too few breaks, hours of backbreaking standing up on the shop floor and many wage deductions and fines. Talking to shop assistants, trying to organize them into union branches of the shop assistants union was how Mary MacArthur learned the ropes of union work. 
It was a hugely exciting time to become a trade union activist. The Scottish Trades Union Congress was just four years old. And trade union membership was in increasing, particularly among unskilled and lower paid workers. And of course, Scotland was the birthplace of some outstanding figures working tirelessly to advance the cause of the labor movement, including, of course, Keir Hardy, who Mary came to know well. Imagine then Mary MacArthur's father's alarm at his daughter's new and unexpected activities. Mr. MacArthur was a prominent, respected member of the local shopkeepers association. His daughter used his business address as her trade union contact. There must have been some pretty serious family clashes or arguments. Once met, Mary MacArthur seems never to have been forgotten. The Assistant Secretary of the Shop Assistants Union and later Britain's first woman cabinet minister, Margaret Bonfield, told of their first meeting on Newcastle Station in 1902. Here in front of her, she said, in a green tartan dress, was genius, allied to boundless enthusiasm and leadership of a high order. High praise indeed, and surely a feeling that grew rather than one that was immediate. But nevertheless, something like this seemed to be recognized by all who met her. And when it became clear that air could no longer contain a young woman of such talent and determination, ambition and youthful confidence took her to London, much of course to the initial alarm of her family. And Margaret Bonfield, once she was in London, introduced her to Gertrude Tuckwell, who was a prominent member of the Women's Trade Union League, which promoted trade unionism among women workers. And Tuckwell recalled how Margaret Bonfield came to my little Westminster flat, bringing a tall slip of a thing, dressed in black, very silent, but intensely attentive with that air of subdued excitement, which made one feel the air alive all around her and herself mentally holding out both hands to adventure, adventure which always came. And I think you see it on the face of Mary MacArthur in this wonderful image, my absolute favorite photograph of MacArthur, definitely looking out with determination, taking the world by storm. And so Mary MacArthur became the secretary of the Women's Trade Union League. She's still only 23 years old, advising and supporting women's unions, expanding its membership and showing London and the rest of the country what it could do for women workers. If she didn't know it already, she soon discovered that it wasn't just women shop assistants who were exploited and underpaid. All over the country, there were overworked women looking for ways to protect themselves in an industrial world that neither valued their worth nor recognized their skills. One of her favorite sayings was that women are badly paid and badly treated because they're not organized. And they're not organized because they're badly paid and badly treated. And this pretty well summed up much of working class women's labor at the start of the 20th century. Women, if they worked at all, were reckoned to have short working lives between school and marriage. While they were in employment, their wages were considerably less than men's. Formal training or apprenticeships were often closed to women because no one considered it worthwhile investing in them before they left to get married. So women workers were assumed to be young, single, and still living with their families. And employers imagined that these girls could live much more cheaply than men, eat less, need less. Men, on the other hand, were paid a higher so-called family wage, whether they were married or not, because it was assumed that they had dependents. The idea 
that women workers only worked before marriage was of course completely wrong. In a society without safety nets, women workers were young, old, single, married, single parents, widowed, and of course, they too had dependents to support. Now, whilst there were women in unions, predominantly in the cotton industry in the Northwest, where women's wages were generally higher than in other industries because of the presence of the unions, it was to the largely hidden army of women that Mary MacArthur turned her attention. The laundry workers, garment makers, metal workers, cardboard box and paper bag makers, tea, jam and sweet packers, ammunition workers, net makers, chain makers. Among these women were those working at home producing goods at speed, repetitive work done under great pressure, paid by the peace, keeping a roof over the family's head. At home, in workshops and in factories, there, these were all women whose wages were scandalously low, who worked excessive hours and in poor conditions. In addition, they, like the shop assistants, were subject to no end of petty fines and pay deductions, which kept their wages even lower for spoilt goods, for going to the loo on work time, for singing and dancing in their lunch break. Employers reckoned that they could treat women like this, but women were surely docile and obedient. And if they did raise their voices in objection, well, they were left in no doubt that someone else would take their place and that they would be left without income and saddled locally with a reputation as a troublemaker. The small women's unions formed or supported by the Women's Trade Union League never had the financial clout to survive the disputes and strikes that arose. So, in 1906, Mary MacArthur founded the National Federation of Women Workers to organize women into one large all-female trade union for women working in a range of industries. Sometimes there was an existing union in the trade from which women were excluded simply because they were women or because male leaders didn't consider it worthwhile bringing them in. Women were widely regarded as being pretty useless trade unionists. The idea then was that the National Federation of Women Workers would develop a network of branches across the country, offer benefits, including strike pay, and bolster itself by affiliating with the General Federation of Trade Unions as insurance in case of lengthy and expensive industrial action. By the end of its first year, there were just a handful of branches from Scotland to London. By 1914, there were over 10,000 members with branches across the country. By 1918, there were up to 80,000 members and some pretty hefty branches. Now, this wasn't a big union by any means, but through some high profile disputes and through the brilliance of Mary MacArthur's publicity campaigns, it received widespread attention. Here is Mary MacArthur uh, in Trafalgar Square in 1908. You can see her with the hat turning back to look at the women that she's bringing into Trafalgar Square. You see her there on the plinth of um, Nelson's column. She's speaking to an audience having marched with a group of women workers from a cardboard box factory in Tooting, out on strike against threatened pay cuts, reducing already impossibly low wages. And here, you can clearly see her passion and her determination. And you can see in the top left, even the sun's come out for Mary MacArthur after a very wet and muddy procession. And not just that, these show her eye for publicity. These images are postcards that were sold to raise funds for the strike. And look, to dramatic effect, she's got the organizers and strikers up on the plinth with her, 
closely watched by the gentlemen of the press. And the women strikers were brave, absolutely love this picture. If you worked in precarious employment and you were subject to intimidation from your employer, the easiest thing was to keep your head down, not attract your boss's attention by joining a union. So hats off to the women then who did join because the barriers to do so were plentiful. As if the risk of victimization wasn't enough. There was the matter of finding union subs when there were so many other demands on an already meager wage. Mary MacArthur understood this and every effort was made to protect activists and to keep in touch with branches, to keep them supported and strong and to give women the confidence to remain in the union. This was evident, for example, in Kidderminster in Worcestershire in 1913 in the carpet industry. A newly formed branch there was supported by regular visits from El Isabel Sloan, a national federation organiser, and Miss Sorrell, the local permanent secretary. A dance at the town hall attracted 600 people and the branch grew to over a thousand members. Socials were always a great way of helping to keep branches together. Now, this was really impressive and proof that you needed activists and good activists on the ground. At the same time as the Kidderminster branch, there seems to have been a concerted effort in Worcester to recruit women with meetings at factory gates and on street corners, arranged again by Federation organisers up from London. The male chair of the Worcester Trades Council noted that the campaign was something of an innovation in the town, which shows, I guess, how hard it was, how hard the women had to work for this. Although, and although a branch was apparently formed, it doesn't appear to have become very firmly established. As I mentioned earlier, probably the best remembered episode um, in the Federation's history was the strike of the women chain makers of Cradley Heath in the Black Country in 1910. Not only was the public incensed to discover that women made chain in forges at the back of their houses, back-breaking, dirty work in which wages were shocking, they learned that employers had deceived the women in order to keep their wages low. The year before, the government had passed the Trade Boards Act, the result of persistent lobbying by anti-poverty campaigners, including Mary MacArthur. The act enabled the setting of minimum wages in some of the country's most notorious so-called sweated industries. When the rate was set in the chain-making industry, employers went to considerable lengths to persuade women to sign a document which effectively meant they agreed to go on working at the old rates, telling them that if they were paid any more, the industry would buckle under the strain and unemployment would become inevitable. And it was easy enough to use intimidatory tactics to make this happen because so many of the women were isolated, homeworking workers. There were some employers then well, the, uh, well, I suppose these same employers could only look, up, look on in amazement as Mary MacArthur and the National Federation of Women Workers brought the women out on strike and they stayed out for 10 weeks until so much pressure was brought to bear on the offending manufacturers that the minimum rate was at last secured. It was a brilliant strike. Funds to support the women poured in from home and abroad. And it showed not just MacArthur's organisational skills and those of those women who worked with her, but her very effective use of the press and above all the importance of the union in women's lives. And the Workers' Institute was built in Cradley Heath with funds raised and left over from the strike. Many of you will have seen this re now relocated at the Black Country Living Museum. Um, so wonderful building, built, built with money left over then from strike funds, really impressive given that strike pay, there'd been enough collected to give strike pay not just to union but to non-union members alike. 
And this Workers' Institute became an important meeting place where workers could keep in touch, not just with the union, but with each other. Always, of course, so much harder for women workers for whom the pub or the club was never a realistic option, even if they had time for it between leaving work and getting home to the family. Mary MacArthur always insisted that the Federation was to be a place of training and education where women could become confident trade unionists, learning from each other, and then when they were ready to work alongside, not against men in the labor movement in mixed sex unions. It meant that the Federation's existence was actually short. It was only about 15 years, merging with the larger National Union of General Workers in 1921 in what Mary MacArthur hoped would strengthen the work already done and ensure women's permanent place in the labor movement. But before then came the First World War. And as women workers in their thousands went into the munitions factories, more and more women recognized the need for trade union membership. For many of them, working in large numbers for the first time in their lives, it became easier to join a union because the chances of being picked off by the employer became a little less. There was, for example, now organization of munition workers in Worcester and thousands of women in Redditch joined the unions. MacArthur and her team of Federation organizers were at the forefront of the fight to ensure that the women received fair pay that government and employers honoured pay and conditions agreements, and that women were kept as safe as possible from the effects of working with dangerous materials used in the production of armaments. And with a national reputation as a champion of women workers before the war began, Mary MacArthur, still only 34 in 1914, now became such a key figure that government, Civil servants, employers, and trade unions knew they were wise to seek consultation with her. And all the time that her reputation was growing and her workload was increasing, Mary had a private life as well. Publicly, she and her husband, Will, they were married in 1911, were regarded by many as the future of British socialism. Will uh, became a Labour MP by 1914, and to Mary, of course, was standing for Labour in Starbridge in 1918. The marriage was a very close and happy one. Apparently, Will had first asked Mary to marry him in 1903, when they were both young trade union activists in Scotland. Perhaps she said no, because she had yet to establish her own working life, to learn to become Mrs. Miss Mary MacArthur before she became Mrs. Will Anderson. A daughter was born to them in 1915, after the tragedy of losing their first baby, stillborn in 1913. This was a couple who lived and breathed, not just their own work, but each other's. They were always optimistic about the future, even when both of them lost their campaigns for Parliament in 1918, they regarded this just as a blip, a, a blow, sure, but little more than an interruption towards an even brighter post-war future. And the tragedy was that none of it was to be. In February 1919, during the Spanish flu pandemic, Will Anderson contracted pneumonia and nothing could be done to save him. He was just 43 when he died a tragedy of enormous proportions for his wife and daughter, and also for the world of politics, for he was widely seen as a future leader of the Labour Party and Prime Minister. Mary's instinct after his death was to throw herself into work. On the return from the second of two trips to America in 1919, those who knew her best began to notice that things weren't right, and from there her decline was rapid. There were two major operations for cancer. And after the first one, she appears to have been told that the disease was terminal. The letter that she wrote to her then four-year-old daughter, Nancy, 
with an instruction for it to be opened on her 14th birthday is heartbreaking. There is, she wrote, only one thing that will make me sorry to leave this place. And this is that I may not surround my precious little daughter with a sheltering love through the years of her childhood and girlhood. So how did I come to be so interested in Mary MacArthur is a question I'm often asked. Well, when I first read about her, I have to confess I was a bit dismissive. I was researching the life of a very different trade unionist, a working class Midlands organiser called Alice Arnold, who worked for the mixed sex workers union. Its operations not over, only overlapped with the National Federation of Women Workers, there was at time a, there was at times a fair amount of rivalry or competition actually at the factory gates for members. And the workers union wasn't alone in the labor movement in its tendency to be critical of anyone in its midst who it thought was not of working class background. And when that someone was also a woman, well, heavens above, she had no chance, dismissed really as do-gooding and interfering. The organisers and the leaders of the Women's Trade Union League and the, and the Federation were sometimes harshly judged for not properly understanding the lives of the women they sought to organise, for being removed from them by class and experience and for going home to comfort and ease. It was not wholly fair criticism. Many of the women who worked as organisers for the League and the Federation were working class women who'd begun their trade union work as branch officials and who understood the rules of the game perfectly. But even if, like Mary McCarthy, you were middle class, the life of a union organiser was never one of comfort and ease. It was unpredictable. You had to be ready to respond to a call for help at short notice. It was exhausting, long hours on trains, nights away from home, being put up by local activists or staying in boarding houses. Mary MacArthur's lists of engagements appear in the League's journal and they reveal a dizzyingly frantic existence. Women organisers in the labour movement were in shorter supply than the men, so they had larger areas to cover, greater workloads, and burnout and exhaustion were common. The need for enforced periods of rest are frequently mentioned in accounts of women activists in this period. Margaret Bonfield wrote that in November 1911, she completely broke down, collapsing in the middle of a speech with a mind perfectly blank. Her, do her doctor ordered complete rest and told her to live like a cabbage, not to read or write or talk. Mary MacArthur lived quite literally above the shop. Yes, OK, this was in a large house in a leafy Bloomsbury Square in London, far removed from the conditions that the majority of Federation members lived in. But her work ethic is beyond dispute, and she was constantly on call, attending a dispute if someone knocked at the office door asking for help when trouble arose. And let's face it, who else wanted to do the work? Sometimes who else could do the work? Working women had to be protected against victimization and intimidation. And they needed someone to take the rap, someone who understood the need for that protection and who was willing to be a spokeswoman at a time when women workers themselves often had no voice. It's easy to criticize. It is much, much harder to lead. Another question I get asked is, would I have liked Mary MacArthur? She was, by all accounts, difficult to work with, impatient, impetuous. She alarmed people with her tears and her righteous wrath. She was hot-headed and she made scenes. She irritated her opponents and she didn't always see eye to eye with her allies. A First World War colleague observed how difficult it must be to keep your feet firmly on the ground when great waves of personal affection and admiration tend to lift you off them. Mary was used to the central place in the picture. And there were moments, said her colleague, when I couldn't help feeling that she rather enjoyed the prospect of being a martyr. 
I have no doubt that at times she was exhausting to be around. And like many exceptionally driven dominant personalities, there were those who couldn't work with her for long. Do I eulogize about her uh, was something that was once said. Now, I'd admit that I admire her, but essentially I, I think it's fair to give credit where I'm pretty sure it's due. Mary MacArthur recognized her talents. She did stand out from the crowd. And yes, that was in part because she, as a middle-class woman, she could. But as a colleague said, she also had deep human sympathy, untiring labor, and natural ability to seize on the right moment. She was a great communicator and the working women themselves loved her. She had sincerity and total conviction of success but she worked herself into the ground. For a woman mindful of the enormous responsibility of her authority, the nature of her job probably made this unavoidable. So it's as a woman and as a brilliant union organizer that I've investigated, researched and written about Mary MacArthur. And one of my favorite parts of the whole process was to feel my way by walking in her footsteps, literally pounding the streets, hoping to imagine myself where she'd been, to get inside her head. My research trips to Scotland were utterly memorable. Outside of the archive offices and libraries, you could argue that there wasn't too much that I actually learned, but it was to scenes like these that I returned in my head when I started writing the book, The Ferry to Butte, where Mary spent so many holidays here at her grandmother's house. Going into shops in Glasgow, being near the site of her father's business, seeing addresses where the Macarthurs had lived in Glasgow. Gazing at the River Doon in air, where Mary's ashes with her husband's were scattered. All of these things brought the story alive for me. I did the same when I wrote a history of the National Federation of Women Workers, always visiting when I could local studies libraries in towns and cities where branches developed, looking for sites of factories, branch meeting places, activist addresses, etc. And if you look at the exhibition that I've just curated on Mary MacArthur for the TUC, you can see the richness of the research materials that I worked with but how wonderful always to be able to discover more. How I wish, as I know Mary's family do, for the reappearance of letters and diaries that were available to her first biographer, Mary Hamilton in the 1920s. Whether or not these ever turn up, their absence has made me all the more aware of the need for all of us to preserve documents, never to take things for granted, to talk to people about their lives and experiences before it's too late. This is so particularly important when it comes to women's lives and working class history. Too often, even in family histories, including my own, histories are defined by what the men did, not the women. I know, for example, what my great grandfathers did. It's been much harder to discover what my great grandmothers did often because it was assumed they were just bringing up the kids. But of course, in every case, they were also paid workers, carers, homemakers, educators. We need not just to carefully record all that women did and do, but acknowledge its enormous importance. So I hope I've given a flavor, not just of Mary MacArthur's life, but also of my interest in her. She improved life for thousands of women workers. There are plenty of activists and organizers since and now who have followed in her footsteps. There have been improvements in women's working conditions. There have been setbacks, but the Federation helped to strengthen women's place at work and in the union. Mary MacArthur's most important work was to highlight the conditions that so many women labored in hidden or forgotten by society. And until bad contracts, inadequate pay, intimidation and exhaustion at work are things of the past, the fight for equality is not won. It is indeed unfinished business. <laughs>
to carry on the campaign in the words of her federation, to fight, to struggle, to right the wrong, is surely the best possible tribute there is to our Mary. And just to end, this is what her friend and colleague, John Mallon, wrote about Mary. He said, seldom, if ever, has the labour movement known a nobler zeal, a keener mind, a purer passion for justice, a more generous sympathy with suffering, a greater or more tender heart. It should hold her memory dear and never let it go. Thank you.